on the Lord's Day, and uh, great to welcome you and welcome those who are back after being away and those who are new. Great to be together. St. Augustine was born on the 13th of November, 354 AD, quite a while ago. He was a Christian theologian, one of the Latin fathers of the church. He was born in what was then Roman North Africa, and he taught rhetoric in Carthage. He had a son, and then he moved to Milan in Italy, where under the influence of St. Ambrose, he was converted and was baptized by St. Saint Saint Ambrose in 387 AD. And then he returned to, to Africa, to North Africa, to pursue a, a contemplative life. And in 396, he became the Bishop of Hippo, now called Anaba in Algeria. So one of the early church fathers on our own continent. And he held that post as Bishop of Hippo until his death when the city of Hippo was under siege by the Vandal army. His best known works are his Confessions, the Confessions of Augustine, which is a biographical, autobiographical meditation on God's grace. And then his other most famous book is The City of God, the nature and of human society and, the, and its place in Christian history. And in the foreword to the 1977 edition of Augustine's Confessions, which I have, Warren Wearsby wrote this. Augustine wrote this book at a time like ours. Now, this is 1977 that Warren Wearsby is writing the foreword to this one of many editions of Augustine's Confessions. Augustine wrote this book at a time like ours, when everything stable seemed to be falling apart. The Roman Empire was crumbling, old customs and values were vanishing, strange new doctrines were appearing, the Christian church was going through a turbulent time of transition and seemed to be losing its hold on society. Young people were rebellious, and older people were frightened. Skepticism and outright atheism were popular. As I read that, I thought, huh. That was what was going on in St. Augustine's time. That was Warren Wiersbe's assessment of the late 1970s. And I read, as I read that, this week I thought, huh, he could have been writing about today. At a time when everything stable seemed to be falling apart, that sound familiar? The Roman Empire, well that's long gone, but society is crumbling, old customs and values are vanishing, strange new doctrines are appearing, the Christian church is going through a turbulent time of transition and seems to be losing its hold on society. Young people are rebellious and older people are frightened. Skepticism and outright atheism are popular. The, growing, the greatest growing relig religion in the West is atheism. And here we are. How did Augustine respond to this challenge? Warren Wiersbe asks. He looked to God. He entered into a deeper relationship with him. Then he translated his worship into service. And he went out to minister to the people. And that 
remains the responsibility of believers. That remains the role of the church in society. Now, Augustine was known for being one of the holiest and most influential of the Latin church fathers. And he lived his daily life according to a four-stage sequence that is biblical, it is simple, and it's relevant, as relevant now in 2021, almost 2022, as it was back around 400 AD. And let me share with you St. Augustine's four-stage sequence, if you like, of living the Christian life every day. And here it is. He said, number one, as one who wants to do all the good you can, you observe what tasks, opportunities, and responsibilities you face. That's where you start. Number two, you pray for help in these, acknowledging that without Christ, you can do nothing. Nothing fruitful, that is. Number three, you go to work with goodwill and a high heart, expecting to be helped as you asked. And number four, you thank God for help given, ask for pardon for your own failures en route, and request more help for the next task. That was Augustine's simple fourfold sequence for living the Christian life every day. In one of John Piper's books where he comments on this, he says this, Augustine's holiness is a hard-working holiness based on endless repetitions of this sequence. Hmm. Now, not wanting to go beyond scripture or to think that I can improve on what Augustine's done, I've kind of rearranged Augustine's four points into seven. And uh, I've given each of them a key word, beginning with the letter A. And these are simple ways of living the Christian life every day, a simple sequence, if you like. And the reason why it's so important, and if, you, if you're taking notes, uh, that's good, but you do have this in your phone, because it was sent out as part of the outline for today. You have it in an email, uh, so you've got no excuse. What I want to encourage you to do is to, is to write it out or print it out somewhere so you can have it in front of you. Because this, even though it is simple, it needs to become part of our, part of our, our own spiritual DNA, part of the way we think, part of the way we operate on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm going to give you seven A's. And the first one is this. The first key word is aspire. Aspire. Not perspire, but aspire, which means to desire. I have a God-given desire to please God in everything. One sure sign that a person is born again is the desire to please God by walking in his ways and obeying his commands. In Ezekiel chapter 36, one of the great uh, passages about the new covenant, we find them in Jeremiah and Ezekiel, Isaiah. This is what God says as he speaks about the new covenant. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities from, and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Talk about transformation. That's conversion, regeneration that we talked about in our seven words series. And then this in verse 27 of Ezekiel 36. 
and I will put my spirit, the Holy Spirit, I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So what is God saying there? He's saying that when you are born again by virtue of having the Holy Spirit in you, you will have a desire. You will aspire to please God. The Holy Spirit will move you. That's one of the signs of new life is a desire, an aspiration to please God. Now, can this desire grow dim? Can it diminish? For sure. And as I've chatted to a number of folk as we look back over this period of, of, of the pandemic, I've had a number of folks say to me, you know, my, something's happened to my desire for God. Um, that's the reason some haven't come back to church after the pandemic. They just, their desire for God is just away, and that doesn't apply to you because you're here. Um, it may apply to those who are watching. It may not. But I think it's been tough to keep our desire strong and vibrant and growing because the whole, the circumstances have, have, have pushed against it. Uh, we haven't been able to gather together. We haven't been able to do the normal things. We had sick and tired of, of screens. And so one of the results of that has been a, a waning or a lessening of desire for God. And uh, I've t spoken to many who said, it's so good to be back meeting together again because I feel that, that that fire, that desire for God that had diminished is being, is being rekindled. Something that won't disappear if you're truly born again. It may diminish, it may dim, but if the Spirit of God is in you, He is going to stir you he is going to move you, as Ezekiel 36 said. I'm going to, I will move them to walk in my ways and be careful to keep my laws. I found that the more time I spend in God's word, the more time I spend in prayer, the more time I spend reading good books that inspire me and encourage me, and uh, the more I neglect those things, my, my desire for God diminishes. That's just the way, that's just the way it is. Um, my desire for God grows when I, when I spend time with people who are close to God. I don't know if you noticed that, you'd be around certain people and they just make you want, they just make you want more of God. Um, and uh, so spending time with people who are walking with God and growing in God is one of the ways, in addition to our own personal spiritual disciplines, of growing and having our desire increase. So that's the first word. Number one, aspire. Number two, second key word, is the word acknowledge. Acknowledge. I acknowledge that without Christ, I can do nothing. Jesus said in John 15, 5, Apart from me, you can do nothing. He said, just as the branch cannot bear fruit unless it remains in the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you are vitally connected to me. And so there's that acknowledgement, Lord, um, I really need you. I can't live this Christian life without you. Acknowledgement, just as a glove without a hand in it is useless, Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. And then the third key word is the word adjust. Adjust. And the sentence here is, I seek by regular repentance to remove hindrances to Christ's working in me and through me. And if we're going to have the Holy Spirit working in us and through us, then we have to adjust our lives. We have to, by re regular repentance, which is what Jesus 
commands, remember, in the, uh, in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. That, that's part of our daily prayer. Um, adjustment, bringing my, if the areas of, of known disobedience, of unconfessed sin, of, of rebellion, those become blockages to the work of the Holy Spirit. If you think of it in, in a couple of ways, if you think of, a, of, an, uh, of an airline pilot, if you've flown in, on, on even a, a, a large jet across the Atlantic, you will, they, they put the plane on autopilot. It sometimes worries me a bit, but uh, they, it seems to work. They put the plane on autopilot, and, uh, but every once in a while you hit some turbulence and that wind can just get the, uh, get the plane just slightly off course. And uh, you'll sense as you're sitting there, the correction is made, whether it's automatically or whether it's manually, the correction is made and you'll just feel this zzz, zzz, and you'll just sense that there's a, a course correction has been made. And if it isn't made, you know, you, you'll land up in Buenos Aires instead of New York. So it's just a case of and uh, we live our lives, we need to live our lives like that. It's very easy with the winds of temptation and the pressures of work and the frustrations of kids and the irritations of traffic and the disappointments of life. It's very easy to end up sinning and getting off course. We can get, I, you know, I can get irritated so quickly and just react in the wrong way, and then, uh-oh, there's, there's that sense of being out of touch with the Lord. And so I need a zzz, and what is the zzz, the zzz, is saying, Lord, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Irene, I'm sorry. Sorry for speaking to you like that. Winston, I'm sorry. Lord, I'm sorry. That's the adjustment. And that's, we live life making adjustments. Repentance is part of life. It's like when you get onto your GPS on your car and you're, you know, you're going along and uh, all of a sudden you, t you, you think you're smarter than the lady in the GPS and uh, the next thing you realize that uh, this little voice says, Changing course or course correction, whatever the, whatever the word is. And, and we need that. And that's what the Holy Spirit says to us. Hey, you've gone the wrong way. You've made the wrong turn. Zzz, zzz, get back. Adjustment. David Brainerd was a wonderful missionary in centuries ago amongst the native Indians in the eastern United States. And uh, he only lived to the age of 30. And yet his, his legacy lives on through his biographies. God did amazing things through David Brainerd. And in his biography, this is said concerning David Brainerd, the whole channel of his life was opened up and cleared out so that the Holy Spirit could flow unhindered through him, turning the savage wilderness into a beautiful garden. And what was he doing? He was clearing out the channel. He was making adjustments. And so living the Christian life every day involves making those adjustments. And then the, the fourth key word is the word ask. So you aspire you acknowledge, Lord, I can't do this without you. You, adjust, you make any adjustments that need to be made as the Holy Spirit convicts you and prompts you. And then you ask for the Lord's help. I pray for the Lord's help. Listen to Jesus' teaching on prayer in, in Luke chapter 11. Breaking in at verse 9. So I say to you, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. 
He who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? How much more will your Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Now keep in mind that when you become a Christian, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and he is in you fully and permanently. You don't lose him and get him again. And lose him. It's not talking about that. It's talking about the, the, the fullness and the power and the help of the Holy Spirit. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And so we ask for help. His name is the helper, the one who comes, the paracletos, the one who comes alongside to help us. And that's not just in the, that's not just when you're preaching or when you're doing some spiritual activity or when you're teaching a, a class of, of kids or a community group. That's for daily living not for just special occasions. So you ask. James said you do not have because you do not ask. Isaiah reminds us those who hope in the Lord, those who trust in the Lord, will renew their strength. They will mount up like wings, on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. So you ask and you just keep on asking. And then number five, the fifth key word is the word act. I act in obedience to God's word. Having, having met those other conditions, you simply get on and do what you have to do. You act. You get on with doing the next thing. Your tasks, your responsibilities, your duties. And if you allow the word of Christ to dwell in you richly, you will know what he wants, you'll, you'll know what he wants you to do. You'll know what he wants you to do in the workplace. You'll know how you, he wants you to relate to your boss, how he wants you to relate to your colleagues, how he wants you to treat those who are subordinate to you. You will know if, if the word of Christ dwells in you richly, how are you to treat your wife, how are you to treat your husband, how are you to, you to treat your children, how are you to relate to the country and the rules of the road and the the responsibility for paying taxes. You will know how to, you to relate to leaders in the church. I mean, it, it's all there in the scriptures. And as, as the word of God dwells in us richly, we will know what to do in most situations. And so you get on and you act. You get up in the morning and you do what you have to do. You act. And then the sixth word is anticipate. As you act, you expect the Lord to help you. How, how can you expect that? Because of his promises. Because of his promises. Ask and it will be given to you. That's his promise. Lord, I've asked you for your help. So you act expecting, believing, trusting that he will indeed help you. Maybe it'll be a specific promise that you will claim. Or maybe just a general promise. Like the Lord says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. That's a general promise. But maybe there's a specific promise that you will need to apply and hold on to and remind God of in a particular situation. And then the last one is, last key word is the word appreciate. And this simply means, I thank God for helping me. Thank him for whatever good comes. Give him glory. Sometimes we can be like those, you remember those 10 lepers that Jesus healed? They all were miraculously healed. And none of them went off glad that they'd been healed. But one turned around and came back and said, thank you. And I think sometimes we can be more like the nine where we ask for the Lord's help but then we fail to thank him. And so appreciation, that's the way 
it works. Now, these, these seven words, which is really all in uh, sort of my, my, my take on St. Augustine's uh, fourfold sequence, aspire, acknowledge, adjust, ask, act, anticipate, appreciate. Um, none of these is a one-off thing. They are day-by-day day actions and attitudes. This is the title of, the, of my message this morning is How to Live the Christian Life Every Day. How do I live the Christian life every day? In your situation, in your job, in your family, in your retirement village, in your school, wherever you are. How do you live the Christian life every day? What does it mean? And how do you, how do you make a difference in this world that uh, was described in Augustine's time and in the 1970s? And wow, we read that and we say, well, this is the world we're living in. How do we, how do we make a difference? How do we live for God? Well, it starts with desire with aspiration, Lord, I, I want to please you. I'm yours, you've saved me, and you've given me a desire to please you. But I acknowledge, Lord, I can't do this without you. Now, I want your help, but I, I just need to get that thing right. I need, I'm aware that I've just blown it, and I, before I take another step, I need to stop and ask your forgiveness. Or may I, I maybe need to get right with somebody else. Or maybe it's some... Maybe it's some big issue. I was chatting last night. We had a, a Zoom class reunion with a number of my Bible college classmates. It was wonderful hearing them. Some of them I hadn't seen their faces for 50 years since we stepped off the, the platform at graduation on the 11th of April, 1971. And here they were on this Zoom conversation last night, our 50-year reunion. And one of the, one of the women who, uh, we all looked pretty young in 1971, and we all look pretty old now, we're all over 70. And uh, one, of the, one of the girls who was on last night, when it came, we, we, we were each given four minutes to, to, to share a little bit of our, of our story. And I hadn't, I hadn't heard of her for 50 years. And she shared her story last night. It was so moving. She said, I had 30 years of hell with my husband. And I left him. We were separated for a year. But God pressed upon me that I needed to give him another chance. But he, she said, I had, to, I had such a battle. She said, I knew I, couldn't, I knew I couldn't make it work unless I forgave him. She said, I was so bitter against him, so angry with him because of the way he treated me for all those years that I had to really, it was a struggle of my life to get to God and to seek God's help so that I could forgive him. And she did, and they got back together, and that was, I think, 10 years ago now. And they, he has changed, she has changed. It was a wonderful story. They've, they've just written a book, or she's written a book about their story with her husband's blessing. But it was a, that, it, that was a huge blockage. It wasn't just some minor irritation that I got irritated in the traffic and I, you know, swore to taxi driver and I said, oh Lord, sorry about that. This was a, some of you got blockages that are massive and God wants to deal with those blockages because you can never be fully used by God unless those blockages are dealt with. So part of this daily walk is, Lord, I wake up in the morning, I want to please you. I know that I need you. I acknowledge that I need you. I make that adjustment. I confess anything that you bring to mind that I need to put right with you or with somebody else. And then I ask for your help. I say, Lord, please fill me with your Holy Spirit. Please help me today. And then I just get on and do what I have to do. You go to school, you go to work, you do what you need to do. 
trusting that God is going to help you in the doing of it. You look back at the end of the day and you say, oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you for your help. I had a phone call the other day from a, a dear friend and uh, she was sharing with me that her, that her dad is critically ill with cancer. He's in hospice. And uh, he's not a believer. He's a highly educated scientist who not, has not been interested. All, the, all of his family have come to Christ, but not him. And they have longed for him to come to Christ. And uh, she said, when I was with him the other day, I asked if I could pray for him. And he said, no. And then she said, would you go visit him? And I said, no. And I said, yes. <laughs> I've met him a few times. I don't know him well. And I was deeply conscious of my own weakness. And as I was driving from my home through to the hospice, I just said, Lord, just please show me if there's anything in my life that is a hindrance to you working through me in this situation. Please help me. Please guide me. Please give me the words to say. And I went in, I took off my mask so he could recognize me. I only known him, met him a few times. And uh, sat down and he had all the normal questions. All the normal questions that any thinking person asks. What about the two million people in China, or, two, or the two billion Chinese. What about this? What about that? All the tough questions that thinking people ask about Christianity. Now, I didn't have all the answers, but the Lord guided me in that conversation. When I said at the end, uh, may I pray for you? I wasn't sure if he'd say yes, because he said no to his daughter. I mean, who am I? And he said, yes, you can pray. So I reached out my hand and I held his hand and we prayed. And then I said, I'm going to leave now. I could tell he was tired. And so as I was leaving, he said, please help me get up. I said, no, you don't need to get up. I can find my way out, no problem. And he said, no, I want to get up because I want to hug you. And so I, he's a big guy. So I dug in and I got him out of the bed. And he put his arms around me. And he's held me. When I finished the hug, tears in his eyes. Pray for him. I don't know, what, I don't know what God's doing. Can't say any more, but that's, but it was just that, it was just that, this unconscious almost, Lord, I need your help for this. Please help me. Show me anything in, in my life that's in the way of you helping me. And then as I drove back in the midst of that lovely Friday afternoon storm when the heavens opened and Johannesburg was flooded as I drove back. I said, Lord, thank you. Thank you. I think you were, I, I know you helped me, but please carry on and do in his life what you need to do. Folk, this is, this is for everybody. This is how to live the Christian life every day. Say, so, so Lord, increase my desire to please you. Help me to acknowledge that I need you. Help me to make any adjustments that I need to make as you prompt me. Don't put it off. Help me to do it now. Help me to ask for your help, believing that you will, and get on and act, trusting that you will, and see you work. And even if I don't, at the end of the day, say, thank you. Thank you for helping me. It's simple. It goes right back to, I mean, St. Augustine was a brilliant intellect. He was a theologian. He was a philosopher. Some of the stuff that he writes in his confessions, I can't even understand. But he lived according to the simple principles that every one of us can understand and apply and live out. So memorize those eight A's. Don't lose them because it needs to become part of your thinking. It needs to become second nature to you to think like that. That's how we live the Christian life every day. Now let's pray together. Lord our God, we thank you for the resources you've given us in your word and in your spirit to live the Christian life every day. Thank you for 
placing us where you have in our season of life, in our spot on this planet. We're so small, so insignificant, and yet you know each of us and you have a plan for us and you have work for us to do. And so we pray that you would teach us to live the Christian life every day, increase our desire to please you, increase our awareness of our need of you, make us quicker to repent deeply from our hearts, not just superficially. Teach us to ask for your help as a matter of course, but to ask in faith and then to act in faith. And then Lord, make us people who are quick to thank you and declare our gratitude to you for you helping us. Teach us this way of living, this way of walking. For your glory, amen.